Well, good evening. We are all here nearly. One of our guests has just had a bit of a problem um, connecting. They've dropped out, coming back in again. But here we are on World War II TV, our deceiver, de ugh, I'll start again, our Deception and Deceivers show, talking about all the trickery involved in 1944. That was my double, bit of an audio issue there. Hang on. So 80 years ago today, with the final events were happening in Dunkirk, perimeter shrinking, last few Brits getting on the boats to go back to, to England. And over the next four years, the Allies were planning how to get back into Europe, how to launch an invasion. We started building up our armies. We started building up our technology, our new aircraft, our new um, uh, weapons of war. But at the same time, the Allies are beginning a new exciting venture to use trickery and deception. And we're going to be talking tonight with the guests who have who are experts in their fields with regards to this subject. And joining me tonight from London, Josh Levine. Uh, welcome to the show, Josh. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. And Josh wrote an excellent book on Operation Fortitude, which I will hold up there, which is, I think, about the best I've read. There's lots of books, big, thick. This is a great introduction and great story and fantastically written. So great book. Thank you. And from the USA, from Chicago, is Rick Bayer, who wrote another equally good book called Ghost Armies about the American unit in the Battle of Normandy and also who's coming in very shortly, his video stream is not quite working yet, no, is Bill Moffat, whose father was part of Operation Fortitude, sitting in a boat off the coast of England, and we'll talk about that later on. Good evening. Good evening, Bill. We haven't, we can't see you yet, but we, I'm sure we will get that, to you very that shortly. That may not be that bad a thing, chaps, really. And Bill, by the way, for those watching, is an archaeologist, so he spends most of his time in holes. So, I mean, he's, he's now out in Probably the public now, as much so, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's all of a new, uh, you know, above ground is good for you, isn't it, Bill? You know, out meeting people. <laughs> Bill is undercover. He's uh, he's already practicing deception on us, so uh, <laughs> we can't reveal his identity. Exactly. He, there's a cardboard right. cutout of Bill in front of the real Bill. It'd have to be quite a big one. Well, indeed. <laughs> so let's perhaps start the subject off. So, Josh, I'm going to bring you in first. Exactly mm. how and when did Operation Fortitude begin and who began it? Well, it, it had its roots uh, really quite far back. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting thing to, to understand because it's not just something that, you know, in, 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 in the weeks or months before uh, D-Day, people thought, oh, I know what we can do, we can, we can fool the Germans. There was a whole trail, basically. There were, there were two pillars, I think, that led to Operation Fortitude. One was the story of strategic deception, which really was created by this one remarkable man, Dudley Clark. Uh, and it was the marriage really of strategic deception uh, with the double cross system. Because th the way that Operation, Operation Fortitude, the Fortitude um, deception was really passed over to the Germans was through the double agents. And so there was this really happy marriage between um, Dudley Clark's strategic deception and this um, this idea, uh, this double cross idea that was being built up um, by uh, MI5 uh, in London. So, I mean, I, I, what I really would say is that, that Dudley Clark, who was the father of strategic deception, so he was working originally for Wavell uh, in the Middle East, and he came up with really the sort of rules of strategic deception, and they're brilliant. I mean, they're really brilliant. If you, if you want to fool the enemy, if you want to fool the opposition, what he said was, you must have, this is number one rule, you must have a clear idea of what you want your opponent to do, how you want him or her to act, what he or she thinks is irrelevant. And he basically worked this out. When he was working for Wavell in the very early days, he passed over this deception, very detailed deception. Um, to make the Italians believe there was an attack coming in Somaliland. And anyway, he, he, the deception was so effective that the Italians believed they couldn't actually defend against it. So they moved all of their soldiers from one area to, a, to the area that was really going to be attacked. So it was completely counterproductive. In, in one sense, it worked totally. 
it fooled the Italians, but he didn't make them do what he wanted them to do. They moved all their troops to the area that was actually going to be attacked. So it made the attack much harder. So that was his primary rule. You must always know what you want your opponent to do. And he found it actually some, uh, uh, some of his generals, when he told them, you know, I, what do you want your enemy to do, your opponent to do? They couldn't answer the question. And he ended up having to say to them, look, I've got a telephone here and your opponent, Hitler's on the other end. Tell him what you want him to do. And he actually had to make them think um, that way. Other things he said was you have to put it across by very small details. So don't put your, all your story across in one great bundle. If you drip feed it in smaller details, then there's much more, you, well, for one thing, the enemy is working it out for himself. So he's much more keen to believe something if he's put all of these things together and come to a conclusion himself. Um, what's another thing? Play on an, uh, the enemy's existing fear. So for example, in, to do with Operation Fortitude, you know, there was already an idea amongst the Germans, uh, a lot of the Germans at different times, that the attack is going to come in the Pas de Calais. Well, if the fear is already there, belief is already there, it's much easier to make somebody think that. Um, and also another thing he said was, you know, it's, it, it's not, um, strategic deception isn't part of, isn't intelligence. It's actually part of the operational plan. You have to know exactly what's happening with the basic operational plan in order to, um, to, to, to build a, a, um, a deception around it. Uh, and then another very important thing was to build up an order of battle. And that again was a long war um, strategy, yeah. some drip feed. So for example, the SAS. The SAS originally was one of um, uh, Dudley Clark's fake units. Um, uh, and eventually Sterling, you know, when, when he created his unit, it took the name of um, uh, this unit, which was, was completely fake up until that time. So if you build up lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of fake units over a period of time, it makes your force uh, seem much, much stronger than, than it otherwise would be. So that really was what Dudley Clark did. He created single-handedly pretty much this idea of strategic deception. And then you have this other pillar, which is um, the double cross, um, the system of, of dull agents. That really started in Britain in 1939 uh, with this sort of strange, uh, duplicitous Welshman called Arthur Owen Snow. He was section B1A uh, of MI5's first double agent. And it kind of grew from there. And by the time, by 1944, by the time um, uh, Fortitude was put into place, there were several really strong double agents who the Germans completely believed uh, were, were their agents, um, but were actually under the control of the British. And actually at that time, the Germans, even though they thought they had, had no, it seems that they had no spies in Britain working for them. They had plenty of people they thought were working for them, but they had all been turned by the British. So these were the two pillars, if you like, I think, of Operation Fortitude, strategic deception uh, and the double cross system. So I think I was going to ask both you and Rick later. Um, we have Barnes Wallace in terms of developing aircraft and bombs. We have Alan yeah. Turing in terms of uh, um, Enigma. Is Dudley Clark therefore the name we should all know in terms of deception? Is that the one? Is he the one you would say, yes, that's the name we should all know? So uh, it looks like uh, Josh uh, we may have, have lost Josh now temporarily. We'll see. Just frozen up. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump in. And certainly Dudley Clark's an amazing figure. I would say that uh, yeah. probably yes is the answer to your question. Although, uh, Josh, I, I don't want to interrupt you. I was just filling in while your signal seemed to disappear. So you jump in. No, I think, well, Rick, carry on because you, you let's, let's, if, if, if we'll, we'll bring in the American story. So sure. concurrently to the, the British developing all their plans with MI5 and what have you, the Americans are doing a similar thing that's sort of running in parallel with slight connections, but really a separate story. So let's bring it, bring in you and the ghost army now. 
Well, and it's connected, especially at the beginning, because uh, American deception efforts, which I think are greater than a lot of people realize in World War II, are entirely inspired by British deception efforts. So they're inspired both by the work of uh, Dudley Clark uh, and A-Force uh, and, and the uh, early days of the fortitude itself. They are also inspired by Operation Bertram, the tactical deception to fool the Germans uh, at the Battle of El Alamein uh, in North Africa. Mm -hmm. So you have one of the American officers involved in creating this unit, Ralph Ingersoll, was actually in North Africa at that time. He wrote a book about his experiences there called The Battle is the Payoff. But I think he takes away some of the um, knowledge of what was done by the British there. And so in, uh, in uh, the second half of 1943, as plans are underway for the Normandy invasion, Fortitude is in full, uh, almost full scale operation. Obviously double cross system is going. Uh, these American officers are trying to figure out what if they can do to bring deception to bear after they have landed in Normandy. Now, uh, keep in mind that these same officers, uh, uh, Ralph Ingersoll and Billy Harris, are coordinating American aspects of fortitude. For example, on another officer, Went Eldridge. Went Eldridge, who was a Dartmouth professor who became a uh, intelligence officer, he is actually responsible for developing uh, American chicken feed that can be uh, rewritten by uh, 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 Bevan or the handlers of, of uh, Garbo and, and his networks and, and uh, transmitted to the Germans. So trying to come up with either as he said, true sounding information, sometimes true and trivial, sometimes not true at all, uh, but true sounding uh, and, and uh, feeding that. So, but the Americans then say, well, what can we do? And inspired by these British efforts, they develop this idea for a mobile multimedia tactical deception unit. So it's a thousand men and they're entirely dedicated. They are entirely dedicated to deception. That's their only mission. They're not doing something else and then brought over to deception. And the idea is that these deceptions will be carried out on the battlefield, that they will use inflatable tanks and trucks and uh, all sorts of things to fool enemy aerial reconnaissance, that they will use sound effects, uh, fool uh, enemy uh, listening posts, that they will use radio deception, probably their most important tool, if not their sexiest tool, uh, to fool the German uh, uh, radio operators and have these all weave together. And this goes back to what Josh was saying and what Dudley Clark was saying. You, 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 as, uh, you start by what you want uh, the enemy to do. And then from that, you have to build a coherent story that you're, of, of your action that you're trying to leak to them. Mm. So you can't just go, well, we want to show them that there's some tanks over here. We want to play some sounds to make it seem like a force here. There has to be a whole story a whole story, and then you leak little bits of that through these different means of deception and hope that they put together that story. So the Americans put together this unit, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop our story before D-Day, but with the idea that they are going to go into action after D-Day, and they do so in uh, late June and in July, uh, over a few weeks period of time, 1944 in Normandy. And we can pick up that story a little bit later yeah, as sure. it happens. I mean, I think I want to bring in a point now that, that when I read about deception, I think one of the things that when you're comparing the allies with the, the Axis is the Axis generally seem to shoehorn all their personnel into a one size fits all military organization. And I think what strikes me about the Fortitude and Ghost Army is we brought in people and used what talents they naturally had and tried to make those talents fit something that would benefit our, our cause. So we bring in these artists and people with completely disparate and weird backgrounds and, and set designers and, and radio and guys and geeks, you know, little technological geeks, who if they were in the army, they would well, have had all their it. skills brought out, taken away. The, the, I mean, the, so the Air Bear was part of the army, but MI5 w wasn't part of the army. And mm. so you had all these strangers. Some of, them, some of them were academics and solicitors who were brought in. But, you, you know, you, you, you had the, the, the man in charge of the, the, the um, Bertram Mill Circus, for example. You know, you had all of these sort of strange eccentrics who were brought in and had, they were intelligent people, but they, as you say, they brought in um, talents and, and a kind of intelligence that wasn't necessarily already there 
uh, in the army. And that's, that's one thing that's quite, also, you know, Dudley Clark himself, that, I mean, he, pretty unusual man. Um, you know, he, he uh, in the interwar era, he, he, he was a member of the Flying Corps during the First War. Um, and already, you know, the flyers in the First World War were already, you know, just slightly different. Um, during, between the wars, he was responsible for organizing the Royal Tournaments. You know, so he was already, I mean, you know, display. Um, display and showmanship. Uh, w- w- yeah. Was a great big, mm. showmanship yeah. was a big element for him. So, you know, we're not talking about, you know, ordinary soldiers here. We're talking about people who have something else to them. And, you know, I mean, Dudley Clark, you know, there's always, people always talk about, when, when people talk about Dudley Clark, I to get it out of the way, Dudley Clark was caught, basically was brought over to Britain um, in the sort of early, early part of the war to try and explain, you know, what this strategic deception was, because he was already doing it out in the Middle East. And then on his way back in, um, uh, when he was in Madrid, supposedly doing, passing over some sort of, uh, uh, deception uh, to do with um, one, one of his double agents in, in, in the Middle East, Cheese, he was caught by the police in Madrid dressed as a woman. <laughs> and the, the pictures are really quite astonishing. I mean, if you see, the, you know, the British police, Madrid police, took photos of him, one dressed as a man, and the other really convincing. I mean, he's, he's a bit masculine, but, but sitting there in, in pearls and a dress and, and gloves and a clutch purse, and nobody to this day knows what he was doing. I mean, you know, and so was it a, just a Friday night for him or was it actually <laughs> well, some I, piece I, of deception? You really don't know. People didn't. Uh, sorry. I think I want to I want to bring Bill in a little bit here because to prove to a to our viewers to prove that Bill is really here because we have nah. no video, but also you know talking about how people got involved in this. Bill, your father was part of Operation Fortitude, and yes. so how do you think? He, what this, does he fulfill? Does he fit this category we're talking of of being someone a little bit different? Well, I suppose he does. I mean, I, I don't think that he did anything particularly out of the ordinary. I mean, he ran away to sea. He learned how to use a radio, went to Marconi school and ended up in the wavy Navy like lots of other people. Um, but he was certainly, um, he seems to have had a, a flair for it. Um, as far as one can tell, his first sort of excursions into um, spookiness are with fortitude. Mm. And um, he carries on with that particular sort of vein right the way through to the end of the war. And thereafter with one of um, the sort of international air radio limited outfits. I think he was, um, he was probably somewhat autistic um, or aspergic or something of that nature. Mm. Um, but he was very, very good at administering and making things work and um, had very little patience for um, mucking around. He would get on with things. And uh, it's hard to say, really. I mean, it, it, to me, he was always a remarkable man, but in many ways, very, very ordinary. And in that he came through the service and so on, doesn't really fit in with... Um, your Welsh nationalists wandering into in, into the Abwehr in Hamburg and um, saying, "Well, um, I've got this thing about selling batteries, but um, do you fancy a bit on the side?" It wasn't one of those. It was more sort of um, you know thrust into it, really. I suppose. I mean, it's hard to say. I don't you know. I don't really know anything from my father at all. This has all been picked up because he never spoke about it. Actually. <laughs> Well, very okay. common. Um, I think we'll, we'll yeah, bring but, uh, in... Can Sorry. I just give you a nice little anecdote there about Dad and the war and how he'd speak about it? I mean, I knew various things about him. Have, he was in PQ-17, managed to get sunk twice on the same day on July the 4th, 1942, which is bloody careless, as he put it. Um, <laughs> and he managed to weave that into his wedding speech and saying that he was going down for the third time when they got married on July the 4th. But I can remember... <laughs> age sort of <laughs> nine or ten going up to him and going what did you do in the war dad and he was reading the paper and he sort of picked shook the paper dropped it a little bit and looked at me went listen to the radio and did a lot of swimming and went back to reading the paper <laughs> <laughs> that's a wonderful anecdote we'll, we'll come back to the one you you told me about about yeah. a certain um french general a little bit later yes. on Yes, let's do that. Yeah. But let's um let's bring it back to to fortitude and indeed 
at the same time ghost army running in parallel. But Josh, you touched on the, the German spies and you know, these, these German spies that they thought were working for them, mm. but they were working for us. And you say that was the sort of one of the key factors in, in getting this to, to the Germans to bite onto this story. Yeah. What yeah. are the other um, thing? I think most people watching this, when they think fortitude, they think that photo of four guys holding up an inflatable Sherman tank. To me, I think that's the- Well, this is what's so interesting about it. Actually, a, a man called um, David Strangeways, Strangeways. Um, who was Monty's deception man, who was very like Monty, actually, you know, just basically cut through, um, didn't care what anybody thought of him. He came along, um, at the time when when um, Fortitude South, because there were, we, we should remember there were, there were there were there were two elements of Operation Fortitude, Fortitude North, um, which, which um, suggested a threat to Scandinavia, to Norway, Fortitude South to the Pas de Calais, and so the, the more important one and the more successful one was Fortitude South. Strangeways came along and basically tore up the existing plan um, for Fortitude, uh, and and said no, th this isn't going to work. Uh, because it had in it, up till that point, quite a lot of physical deception uh, in it. And uh, one thing that Strangeway said was, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to go down. I mean, the, the, the Germans aren't sending over enough reconnaissance aircraft, um, and even though we didn't quite know it at the time, you know, the, the, the spies weren't watching. So it, it was really sort of wasting the time making, using too much physical deception. Physical deception absolutely was used. You know, mm. fake landing craft, um, the, 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 the wet bobs and the big bobs, the big bobs were tank mm. landing craft, the wet bobs, which just shows who these deceivers were because those were terms used at, at Eton. Um, but but the... Um, so, so, so those were built along the coast um, and on rivers, and you know they, they were placed there. And there were other things used. There were fake, fake um, um, uh, airfields were used, and there, there was even um, uh, a, a large sort of oil facility which was opened by the king. Um, so there were fakes used, but for the most part, he got rid of those, um, and he decided that that really. You know, and also got rid of any real troop movements again. You know, that, that he decided was a, a waste of time. What he wanted to do, two really remarkable things, before uh, uh, D-Day itself, not really any mention of the Pas de Calais, just drip feed an order of battle. So, you know, so, so, so have all of these units sort of starting to move into the southeast, but what he created was this large overarching fake unit, FUSAG, the first yeah. United yeah. States Army Group. That was the act of genius. Uh, that, and giving that Patton the job as well. That wasn't a bad idea either. Well, you see, he didn't, Patton wasn't his idea, interesting. Oh, really? That was, that was somebody else's idea that came slightly later, um, only hmm. a little bit later, um, uh, a man called Harmer. But, but yes, absolutely, to put Patton in charge because the Germans loved Patton. I mean, the mm -hmm. German, you know, Patton was everything that Hitler and, and the Nazis thought a general should be. Mm. And you know, when, when, <laughs> when, when Patton had been slapping the, the, the troops in, in um, Sicily, the Germans, well, the Germans thought two things. First of all, they thought, well, yes, he's just showing, you know, there's a bit of discipline. That's what he should be doing. And they actually started to think, well, perhaps this is deception on us because they couldn't possibly have put him in trouble for doing that. So yeah. this must be a made up story. Yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, so to put Patton in charge, and they, the Germans would have expected Patton to be in charge. Also, he had a rivalry with Monty, you know, a known rivalry yeah. with Monty. So it made perfect sense to have Monty in charge of, of one group and Patton in charge uh, of the other group. So, uh, so yes, so, so to create this first United States Army group that was assembling um, in Southeast England, and then the idea was just a drip feed. So, so the, the double agents would notice the, a cat bag here or, or a Jeep here or, you know, just a, a insignia here. And over time, this, the, 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 basically the Germans bought it. The, the, mm. In, in um, May 1944, uh, a map was captured of what the Germans believed British uh, dispositions were. Uh, around Britain at the time, and it basically mirrored the Fortitude South story. I mean, it, you know, they they were absolutely. Of course, the British were knew what the Germans thought because they had Ultra 
Uh, so mm -hmm. in some ways, they, they saw the Germans marking their homework. Um, but the fact was that it, it, it clearly was working. Um, the, the, well, I think the, I want to bring Rick in in a minute. United Rick's been waiting to was... say something. I, I'm, not, you can, I'm poised to speak. I, I, so. I'll, I'll come to you in one second, Rick. I just wanted to come back just briefly to Patton. I think one of the other things about Patton that was very clever from the Eisenhower and the Allied commander's point of view is the slapping of the soldier incident probably needed, Patton mm. needed to be reprimanded somehow, didn't he? There were, he, he, he couldn't kind of be seen to not be punished for that. So Eisenhower, by giving him the Fuzag job, is in the, with one hand, he's giving him something but he's taking away a real command. So it's like he's punishing him and rewarding him at the same time, saying this, what you're doing is very important, but it's not going to be the invasion you want. So I think it was a master stroke to actually use Pat in the way that he walks yeah. out of that room thinking, have I been rewarded or punished? Well, yeah, both and neither. <laughs> but I want to come back yes, to Rick yes, now, because Rick wanted to you know, say something about that there. So Rick, please, what were you going to say? Uh, well, I wanted to, to jump in, on the, and, and I was just glad, uh, uh, Josh, to hear you talking about the, uh, the dummies. Um, this is, uh, by which I'm not talking about uh, uh, Patton or Eisenhower or Montgomery, I'm talking about the mm. tanks. Yeah. Uh, because this is, uh, what I run into is two things. There's two pieces of, of uh, misunderstanding that I am constantly trying to deal with. And one is that when I tell people about this American unit, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, and they're acting on the battlefields in Europe, and I can talk about it and explain it in detail. And the first question I get, is this the same as Operation Fortitude and the D-Day deception? So people cannot separate them apart. But the second piece of misinformation I'm constantly fighting is exactly what Josh was talking about, which is the idea that um, uh, Fortitude used inflatable tanks, that there were, and you there's probably a hundred books mm. that you can read mm. in that say that Operation Fortitude used inflatable tanks. You can't find anybody who worked on any of them. Mm. Um, very secret, they you they see, Richard. Very <laughs> secret. So, <laughs> so, so secret that no one ever saw them or knew anything about them. I mean, I, I was prepping for this show today, and I just put into Google Operation Fortitude image search, and about three quarters of the images that come up are is that same shot of the inflatable Sherman. Yeah. Well, um, and, 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 and not much else. It may be that there's a reason for this, aside from just the general conflation of ideas, because in um, conflation May 1940, of inflation, you missed the pun, you missed the trick there. Uh, conflation sorry. of inflation. Inflation, inflation. Uh, the uh, the in May 1944, when the the Ghost Army, which is officially called the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, they are operating out of. Um, uh, uh, um, a manor house in the grounds uh, outside of Stratford on Avon, and um, but they do a uh, they have practice exercises and they send them out to the Thetford Proving Ground, uh, and there they carry out three days of practice exercises around the time of May thirtieth, thirty first, nineteen forty four, called Cabbage, Spam, and Cheese, I believe, right. and they are setting up their inflatables there to uh, practice, uh, you know, what they're going to do when they're on the continent. And it may be that that little bit of, um, of uh, action happening as it does in an area not far from East Anglia, not far from where FUSAG is supposedly uh, um, building up its force, is responsible for people believing that inflatable tanks were part of Operation Fortitude. So I, I'm going really, to be really the layman good. German now. Okay, I'm going to be an, an idiot German working for the Abwehr, okay? And I'm going to bring it back to things like our senses, uh, sound and hearing and senses, because the pro my problem with the fake stuff, inflatable tanks and wooden landing craft and plywood, this is there's always a chance someone can actually see that that's a fake. And once they see that yeah. something's fake, that's it. The gig is up. You've, if, if, if the Germans detected that a something is fake, but radio traffic and spies where it's coming through your ears, Mm. It's like when it's like when you hear a noise outside at night and you're freaked out yeah. by it and you think, what the hell is that noise? And it's you go outside and you put your light on. You thought, oh, it's just a cat with a tin can. So mm. to me, basing the success on audio is is the key to it working more than the visual senses. But of course, we are a vi we know when we search on Google. That's why the image of the Sherman tank comes up, because it's a it's a it's a visual image. But to me, the idea of using spies yeah. and using radio traffic, and we'll bring Bill in to talk about his father yeah. again, is much more convincing for the Germans because you've always got that level of doubt. 
You can't, ab no matter how much information is coming through from spies, you cannot be 100% certain of what you're listening to. But once you've seen something fake, that's it. You've realized it's fake. Am I, am I, am I onto something there? Is that, does that make sense? And I think that was, that was Strangeway's issue. He, yeah. he, he was concerned yeah. that, that people would see that stuff. And that is also why, um, although the 23rd went into theater with the capability of doing uh, visual deception with their inflatables, it ended up being a relatively small part of the overall deception they did because they focused on the things you're talking about. And I, I think with the, and um, interesting with the Elin oh. stuff, sorry, Josh, I think with the Terrible. stuff that with radio and so on, is that it gives the enemy the opportunity to believe that they've caught something mm -hmm. rather and it's much easier because you're not actually necessarily directing that at anyone particular you put it out and it will be picked up and somebody will run through it and they'll go hang on a minute this little snippet of this signal and it, it it's it gives the enemy much more of a sense of of the way to victory than some pictures of tanks in a field in East Anglia ever could, because it's just like good storytelling is you're not mm -hmm. telling them you're, you're just sort of, you're dripping the detail. And that enables that detail to be put together by a number of different people. And then somebody who's very pleased with themselves puts that all together and goes, good heavens, 52nd Lowland division are in um, Harwich or whatever. And they're not, they're in, um, in Sterling or whatever. Mm. I think that is what's so powerful about about comms of that sort, and somewhat ironic that you can't actually see me leathering <laughs> on about this. So in the fact is, we actually could be listening to a fake bill, and the real bill is actually talking on another, the, oh. another video <laughs> podcast somewhere else, <laughs> and giving and you're giving us staff information. That's obviously what's yeah. going on, and we're yeah. we're falling for it. We are the advert. We believe your bill because you sound like the bill I've heard before. So you know. Yeah. I'm, 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 was convinced. that sketchy photo to begin with the beard and such? Um, actually, my aunt Mabel, ah, uh, yeah, that's what my I aunt thought. Mabel, the unsung hero of um, of Fortitude. But anyway, let's bring it back to Ooh. um, to Josh and I think and, and the Fortitude. So, the, the the spies, and and I wanted to pick up for people watching this when you mentioned both and Rick did as well, um, Strange Ways, yeah. For anyone who's a James Bond fan of the books, particularly, that name is familiar, of course, because there's a Colonel Strange Ways in Doctor No. Because Ian Fleming, of course, is involved as one of the peripheral figures in all this and Absolutely. borrowed lots of ideas. Because um, so, you know, if you, I mean, I know we're kind of playing to the crowd here a bit, but just for the, you know, because we've got people watching this. What's Whoa. all the kind of Bond connection, Josh? And the, where does it where does the influence of fortitude enter our kind of consciousness with regards to the, well, the Bond film? Well, there's a, there's a very definite, well, there's a, there's a, there is a possible connection here. And that's, I mean, there were, there were four, really four double agents um, who were involved, heavily involved in passing um, in, in information to the Germans regarding fortitude. And one of them was a man called Dusko Popov, code name was Tricycle. Um, and he, he was really, a, he was a, a Yugoslav playboy. Uh, and he, in Lisbon, he was really the most dangerous, he had the most dangerous job of, of, of the double agents because he actually went to report in person. A lot of them, you know, mm. wrote letters or some of them um, uh, sent, sent wireless messages. Popov actually went to Lisbon and, and reported in person. So there was always a chance he wouldn't come back. Um, and on one occasion when he was in Lisbon, uh, he came across um, Fleming. And this was when he was actually in the Estoril Casino. And he'd been given, this is, this is a true story, he'd been given money by the Abwehr. It was a, the idea was he was going to take it to New York and place it because he was, he was actually sent to America. Um, and he was going to place this money uh, in New York in a bank account for the Abwehr. And what he did was he actually put the money down in the casino. Uh, and this supposedly was seen by Fleming, who was there. And Fleming then took that for the opening scene of Casino Royale. The, oh. the 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 uh, scene with the chief. Um, now, is that true? I really don't know, but that's the story that's gone down. And they certainly both were in in uh, Lisbon at the same time, Popoff and and Fleming. So there really is, uh, you know, a potential bond connection there. Mm. And Popoff was, you know, he ha he lived that life. He was a he was a playboy. Um, you know, after the war, married two seventeen year olds, and he was a lot older than that himself. That's. Mm. I some of the double agents were. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, they were an odd lot, weren't they? Interesting. They were. Very interesting. They yeah. were. Some of them were incredibly, you know, wrapped up in their own sort of self-importance. I mean, some of them were people, uh, you know, who, who, who arrived as spies and then were turned. Uh, mm. And then some of them, you know, did it out of their own political beliefs and their own ideologies. You know, they... they yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting group. I, I can't. Was it, it Popov? Wouldn't wouldn't have been the um, the Polish chap. I'm trying to remember no. his name. That was Chernyavsky, Roman Chernyavsky. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. where the Germans recruited him because he was a Polish nationalist, and they thought that would be a good thing. Well, he he actually started <laughs> up. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so lost that's a, yeah, so they, frustrating. Oh dear. Well, we're, we're so um, bringing it back to the spies again. So um, uh, yeah. the uh, these these disparate fi figures involved, for whatever reason they are, are feeding this this fake information, but not too much. We're drip feeding them a little bit here, a little bit there, keeping it going, yeah. keeping the story going. And I think your point earlier, Josh, is very important. I think it was very key that we were trying to persuade the Germans that we were landing in the Pas de Calais and hiding the Norman invasion, because had we, and I'm, I'm a battlefield guide, so I actually talk about the beaches, had we done it the other way, had we decided to land in Padicalay and deceive them into landing in Normandy, yeah. I think no. that would have been much harder because the Germans wanted to believe it that was Padicalay. In my head, and, and there's, there's, there's a, two blackboards in Abwehr with Padicalay and Normandy written on them, and, and every tick that goes in the Padicalay is helping, but their default position is always to put the tick in Padicalay because that's the logical one. Normandy makes no sense; it's, it's much further away. And and I think that's the key to it working is they wanted to believe it was Padicalay. So all you've got to do is it, just I nudge think, them. In 1940, yeah, absolutely. And in, in 1940, the German plan for invasion was to invade from the Pas de Calais over yeah. to the southeast England. So I don't, really, you know, where the um, Romans so, had done so, yes, it, where, where William the Conqueror had done it, southeast. It's it's always been that's traditionally that's where you invade England back and forth. So, you know, that to me was the key success is is convincing them something they really wanted to believe anyway. So they're always going to come back to well, it's got to be Calais, and I think that's playing into without racially stereotyping anybody, the German logical way of thinking. You know, one of my friends here says it's very interesting that the Germans never invented freestyle jazz because it's just against the way they think. Freestyle jazz came out of Chicago, where, where Rick is from. That's where jazz and blues come out of, merging things and freestyle. And, and it never happened in Germany. Germany is, yeah. is more... My God, the I mean, the Nazis hated swing. I mean, you know, the Nazis' yeah. attitude... To Jazz and swing. Interesting. I, I lived in Germany for about 18 months, quite a few years ago, and I've always thought of it as the easiest place I've ever lived to misbehave because nobody expects you to do so. They just assume you have permission. And it's, you know, that, that I think is part of the, the what's behind the success of Double Cross is there wasn't ever anybody thinking, hang on. These guys might be trying. Well, I think, you know, I, I think that's right. And I think, but another, sorry. I think another reason behind the success of Double Cross is that all, you know, the handlers wanted their agents to be bona fide. They, they gave them the benefit of the doubt um, yeah. mm. all the time. Uh, and, and you can understand their, their lives were entwined with these people. They didn't want to think that they weren't bona fide. So they would absolutely defend them to the hilt. And then in Germany, you know, you had this situation where if your if your person wasn't bona fide, you could get in a hell of a lot of trouble. So you defended them even further. Um, mm. Mm. So, so and I'm know, guessing as, as more and more months, if you're a handler, as more and more weeks and months pass, the even if you start having doubts, you're going to start thinking, "Hang on, I've been doing this for months now. If I now say this seems a bit weird, you're, you're under suspicion as well. You're you're the idiot for not noticing it earlier. So Absolutely. maybe you just kind of keep going Absolutely. on with it because mm. in for a penny, in for a pound, you might as well keep on going now because uh, so. And they got very close. I mean, after the war, after the war, Garbo's handler said to him, "You know, when it all finished, they still believed in him." And Garbo's handler said, "You know, can you help me?" You know what? What can you set me up after the war? I mean, this. You know, they, he actually felt as though they had this level of closeness that you know he had maybe felt he protected Garbo. Now it's Garbo's job to him. So, mm. so absolutely, that... yeah. There was, there was, there was, there was, there was the problem. 
there's a tremendous amount of psychology involved in deception. I think you could write an entire uh, psychology handbook based on the various types of deception and the different things that you have to do to kind of get into the the uh, mind of your enemy. And one of the soldiers who was in the ghost army, he was not a planner, he was not high ranking, he was a private, but his name was Jack Macy and he went on to do all this amazing exhibit design in the US, including he designed the the kitchen that the famous kitchen debate took place in with uh, uh, Khrushchev and Nixon in, uh, in the mm. Moscow World Exposition. Mm. He helped design the American uh, exhibit uh, at Expo 67, various museum exhibits in the US. But he had a whole theory about the, 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 the what's involved in um, when you're trying to communicate to an audience that does not want to believe you. And that's really what you're doing here. So if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm the, the British or the Americans, I'm trying to communicate to the Germans. They, of course, are not going to believe anything I say. Therefore, what can I do to communicate? And of course, I, they're right not to believe it because I'm lying through my teeth. What can I do to convince them of that? And there's all these pieces, one of which uh, is this idea of um, um, letting them piece it together and figure it out. One of them is appealing to what they are already more likely to believe. And another one is you have to find the channels of information. What are the channels that they are listening to? And I use listening in quotes, but where are they getting their information from? And, uh, and then you have to send out a unified message to all those channels so that if Garbo or Tricycle has uh, something that they're saying that that's not going to be contradicted by the radio uh, uh, operators of the of another American unit, the 3103rd, who are setting up the phony radio signals of, of FUSAG. It's not going to be contradicted by the big bobs being in the wrong harbor. It's not going to be contradicted by the actor playing Montgomery being in the wrong place. Mm. It all has to have the same story and then feed that out on all these channels. And that was equally mm. true of fortitude and true of what the ghost army did in the 20 two battlefield deceptions they did starting so after let's, let's sum things up where we are at this point so so we're trying to get the germans to put together a jigsaw puzzle separately all across the, the abwehr and into a little piece of the puzzle but it must be the same puzzle they must be putting together bits of the same puzzle otherwise it doesn't work yes. and this has been going on for, for years before d but now let's bring it up to the last few days as the operation overlord is about to happen and then we can bring bill's yeah and his father in again so we now have this massive great army on the southwest of england to actually do the invasion yes. fuzag uh, is in the east of england you've got operation fortitude north and operation fortitude south so they're trying to prince the germans we're probably going to go to pas de calais but there's also this possibility of us going to norway either instead or as well as pas de calais yep. but we're still doing the actual invasion normally so so basically the the, the ante is getting up now everyone all the all the chips are on the table now the the about up and they're, they're, they're how do we crank it up? How do, what's the it, next stage? Well, so there are other little, little side issues. You just mentioned uh, uh, Operation uh, Copperhead. So this is Monty's double. The idea mm. was, you know, a week before, if uh, Montgomery showed up in Gibraltar and the Middle East, and, you know, we can't be about to have uh, an, an invasion. So, th so this idea was that what, what they did, again, it was originally Dudley Clark's idea, they, they found a, an actor who was also in the pay corps who looked a lot like Monty. They actually tried three actors and the first one was wrong height and the second one broke his leg or something. Then they found this perfect one uh, and they sent him to, first of all, to Gibraltar. They made sure that they knew uh, a spy was watching. They, got, they saw the spy getting all excited. Uh, and then he, he met the governor, Eastwood, the governor, and he was seen shaking hands with the governor and slapping him on the back. And then he went on um, to the Middle East. And in fact, he was paid Monty's pay for the period that he was playing mm. Monty. It didn't really have any effect, but you know, it was another thing. Also Hans Kramer, this was a man who had been taken prisoner in North Africa, general taken prisoner in North Africa. He was then released on a prisoner exchange and he was brought through Southwest England, watching all the troop buildups, but he was sat there in his car with a corporal who told him that he was moving through Southeast England and they changed all the road signs. Mm. So he got back, told Rommel immediately, I'm just back from Southeast England, we're building everything for invasion. Lots again, little strands. 
they work, maybe didn't work. But this was the build up to the real thing, to the big thing. And then, well, I'm just, I'm just, 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 I'll get right back to you. But you, the thing is, you, you never know when you put these things out, which one they're going to believe. So there's always going to be a lot of information you put out that nobody hears. You're hoping for that one thing they do hear. And as you yeah. said before, you know, these, they, there's a danger of things contradicting. You know, there's a danger of things working against each other. So, you know, the more you put out, yes, you're giving yourself more chance in one sense, but there's also a real danger that, you know, you may actually just over egg the pudding. You may just take it mm. a step too far. And the more plates you're spinning, the more that they're, 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 the more you've got to control it. Because someone's there's some Sven Garley behind this, yeah. managing all these operations at the same time, making sure, as we say, they don't contradict each other, that one doesn't fail. And I, I love the story about the the, the the Monty's double because one of the genuine British Army officers involved with him was David Niven, who of course became the actor, yeah. and he or was an actor, and he was asked yeah. to be in the film. I was Monty's double, made in 1958 which John Mills eventually took the part because David Niven said, I had to work with that lunatic once in the war when it was in the service of my country. I'm not doing it now for a film because apparently the guy was a yeah. drunk. I mean, he was, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's long since passed Clifton away. James. Not, no Clifton now, James. Yeah, Clifton James. Yeah. Clifton Mary James. Clifton he, James. And he was, yes, he was, a, he was a pretty odd man. Uh, and, and the funny thing and was, you know, Monty he was, then, really. <laughs> well, yeah, Monty was an odd man as well, but yeah. <laughs> in different it, it probably didn't ways, have yeah. much effect. No. Oh, sorry. So let's bring it back to the, the Bill, you're speaking your dad. So one of the things right. when we're talking about how to plan this is one of the aspects is it's really getting really close to D-Day is the, the, the Operation Glimmer and the dropping of all the chaff, the window, the, yes. the aluminium strips in the air yeah. uh, in other parts of the Netherlands and Belgium and France, which would essentially jam German radar screens to cover the actual fleet going across from Portsmouth and the, yeah. uh, the southwest to, to Normandy. So we don't and, know. And also to provide extent. some kind of um, uh, sense of a different fleet in the Pas de Calais. Yeah, so uh, under the chaff in the sky, yeah. which is a physical thing we're dropping, yeah. there's also this, so we're trying to suggest to Germans that we're sending a fleet off as, as well. So yeah. what we know about your father is, and I'll let you tell the story, is basically as a radio guy, he is seconded to a French ship and then I'll, or a yes. boat, and I'll let you carry on the story from there. Okay. Well, so that, um, as far as I understand it, he was out there um, in the, you know, the late night of the 4th and the, and the morning of the 5th, and it was bloody awful weather, and um, they couldn't do a thing. And, of course, the whole thing got scrubbed for the following day. So they went back. I think they were in Harwich, and they were going out from Harwich, and before that happened for the, the sixth, de Gaulle came and um, inspected a whole bunch of, you know, the, the massive French army that was obviously massing at that point, largely consisting of the trawler my dad was on and probably some, um, some uh, fancy staff cars. Um, but it, he's, uh, it's bloody annoying because of this coronavirus nonsense. I could have got the photograph, well, I would have been able to show you the photograph of the, uh, of the, of the ship's company or any of that and um but anyway he's on there doing his thing and um i'm not absolutely certain what that was but something to do with um keeping up uh, radio chatter and radio chaff to go along with all the rest of it hinting at the movement of material from east anglia straight across the sea and uh, de gaulle comes on board and inspects the ship's company um who presumably were all beautifully turned out in crisply ironed French uniforms, and I doubt if my dad was. Um, but he overheard the, the de Gaulle talking to the skipper. And of course, one of the reasons why dad was on this kind of thing was he was very good with languages. So he, he could speak French and awful French, this, you know, as well, you know, Marseille French. And, um, and he could hear these guys chattering on and de Gaulle's going to the French skipper. He's going, why on earth? have you got a bloody British radio officer? And my dad, in, I imagine, in one of those very bored naval sort of voices, just said, because you haven't got any bloody radio officers of your own. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. off they go to sea. Yeah. And, um, and, and that was his experience of D-Day. And why I'm, you know, I've become interested in fortitude later on. And... Um, and that kind of intelligence gathering stuff 
because once once D Day had passed the unit that he was with, if there was such a unit in in any sense, he would follow that around to Antwerp and um, and Hamburg and so on, and collect code books and radio equipment and and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So, so he could have been with 30 AU or, or Phantom or someone like that, couldn't he? Someone I mean, that... like that, yeah. I know that he, poor bugger, um, ended up on probably on or about the 4th or the 5th of May, he ended up being sent down to Bergen from um, Hamburg and saw Belsen um, by accident. Mm. And then after... after um, Victory in Europe, he went out to the Far East and started mucking around with magic instead of with ultra and um, ended up in Japan. So, so. so clearly his, his radio skills were, were good enough because obviously the wavy Navy didn't do much on land. So he's obviously no. with, <laughs> he's with, with the land forces because of his superior skills with whatever, whatever, it, whatever it was he was actually doing with radios. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, he never told you about it. And this, you know, I was talking to I did an email to Josh earlier today. You know, the thing is, you know, the archives of the big level stuff is kind of there. Mm -hmm. But there's obviously little, at the bottom end, these little people being brought in to do little yeah. things that didn't talk yeah. about it, weren't officially attached to units and just went about their separate ways and have promptly you know, died after the war. So I think at the bottom mm -hmm. end of the story, there's lots of there's still some mystery to um mm. to unravel that we probably won't ever get to the bottom of. But um. So let's to keep on course and you know, viewers mm. patiently sitting to us there. So we managed to convince the Germans that we are um, uh, we're going into the Pas de Calais. And then, of course, surprise, surprise, morning of June the 6th, bang, we land in, in, in Normandy and the Germans realize they've been tricked. Or have they? Because, of course, Josh, it has to continue. Your garbos no, and tricycles no, have to keep not. on going. So what the next few days were just as vital because there's German yeah. reserves, there's German tank divisions that are, that are engines running, which way to go. And Rick, we'll bring you in in a minute, patiently sitting there in Chicago. We will bring you in. But the next bit is, is really sorry, key. Josh. How, how, do we, how do we crank things up then? How do we keep it going? Well, so th this is where Garbo comes into his own. This is Juan Pujol, who's a Spanish chicken farmer who served with both sides during the Spanish Civil War, hated um, Nazism, tried to join the British, uh, tried to become a British uh, agent for the British. They turned him down um, in, in Madrid, so became an agent for the Germans, told the Germans that he was going over to Britain when he never was. And so for ages of reporting, sending the material as though he was an agent in Britain, but he wasn't, and eventually the British took him on. This was now his moment. So what he did the night of D-Day, so before the Germans have spotted the, 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 the um, invasion force coming, he actually sent a message to his handlers saying the invasion was on its way and they weren't listening. And so the next morning when they came back to their post, he said, you weren't listening to me, this is a terrible, this is disgraceful. You must listen from now on. So this was where he really, so, so basically a couple of days later, he sent a message. Up till now, the deceivers have been very careful to follow Dudley Clark's rule. You know, just drip feed it. Don't send it all uh, at once because you know, you'll, you'll make them suspicious. Much better, they work it out for themselves. That's where they broke it at this point. Mm. Two days later, Garbo got on the air uh, and he said, right, you're, don't move anything from the Pas de Calais down to Normandy. What you're seeing in this attack on Normandy, it's diversion. The big attack is still coming in the Pas de Calais. What he said was, I've got, because he pretended to have something like 27 sub-agents all around Britain. This is why the Germans didn't need to send any more spies. They thought with this one man, they had a whole network of spies. Mm. He said, I've had a meeting of my chief sub-agents. We all agree that the, 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 the big attack is still coming with this FUSAG in uh, Southeast England. So don't move anything. And they'd all, the Germans had actually started to move the first SS Panzer Division, mm -hmm. the Gross Deutschland Regiment. They were about to move the 85th Infantry Division, I think the 16th Luftwaffe Division. Mm, yeah. And they turned the two that 
started moving, they turned around, and the that hadn't yet moved, they came there. That is remarkable. And we know that that message also reached Hitler. We know that, that Garbo's message reached Hitler. Uh, and so that is, I mean, uh, you know, in, in the end, that's the story. Uh, of, of, of Operation Fortitude. So it wasn't done through physical deception. And even though this amazing wireless network was set up, mm. the 3103rd mm. and the five wireless group, in the end, it wasn't done through wireless either. Um, it was achieved through th this basically one Spanish chicken farmer. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it is extraordinary. I mean, for those watching it to think that, you know, without hyperbole and exaggerating, you know, the fate of the free world is is resting on a Spanish chicken farmer sending one radio call that is heard by the right person mm. that prevents reinforcements mm. coming. It is if, if you made it up, it would sound implausible. And yet it is actually true. And, and you know, we, we know because Patton, we touched on Patton earlier and Patton, his third army that he's promised the command of actually joining the invasion of Normandy. The third army arrives in Normandy before Patton actually can, because he's still serving this role as the the commander or, or second in command. Is he second in command or third? Uh, Fuzag. So, no, he's, 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 he's so there is this. There is the rumors in Normandy that he was coming to Normandy dressed as a sergeant for three or four days, setting things up, and then officially came in Normandy a, four, a few days later. There's lots of debate about when Patton actually set foot in in Normandy. And then that, there's that moment when the Abwehr and Hitler see Patton in Normandy and they go, oh, shit, you know, we, have, <laughs> we have fallen for the biggest ruse since the Trojan horse. And yeah. in terms of fortitude, yeah. kind of the, the jig is up now, really, isn't it? That's it. We've, 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 we've thrown everything into it. They now realize Normandy is it. Now, Rick, I want to bring you, you in now because the ghost army, they've just been sitting in the wings now waiting to come in. So we're now, we're now in Normandy. It's the just kind of like me. Right. It's just like you. Well, we're, we're getting to you now. We're getting to you now, Rick. It's all good stuff. So um, at this point as well, I suppose the Abwehr are, think, are now a bit more cautious generally because maybe they're realizing that we have been much more devious and deceptive than they thought we were. And yet we're going to try and do it again on, on a perhaps smaller scale with yeah, the so Ghost the Army. The ghost army is on a much smaller scale, um, and and um, you know it's the idea of the ghost army. Of course, fortitude is a great strategic deception uh, in the Dudley Clark tradition. The twenty third, the ghost army. This is a tactical deception unit. So the idea is that they will be called upon, depending on what the situation is, to try to do small scale deceptions that may last a day or two or three days. And I always liken them. Um, you know, um, I don't know if you guys ever watch American football uh, uh, in the UK, but uh, if you can, if you can, uh, by the nod of your head or a twitch of your body, if you can delay someone half a step, it can make a huge difference in a big play. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is the goal of the Ghost Army. They're never going to fool anybody for long. They may only half fool them for half a day, but you <coughs> might just hold off long enough to uh, be able to make something happen. So they come into Normandy. They have an initial contingent that does a very small deception. They are pretending to be a, uh, an artillery battery. They have um, uh, inflatable artillery and they have um, uh, flashbang devices. Uh, you know, they make smoke and, uh, and a flash and they actually will will synchronize these with the real battery and so the idea and they go in eight days after d-day the idea is to try to draw the artillery fire against themselves instead of against the real battery which they succeed in doing the rest of the unit doesn't come over until late june their first deception is in normandy it's called operation elephant this is a, an allusion to um, american soldiers in the civil war called combat seeing the elephant Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, Elephant was their first deception. And uh, they are pretending to be the second armored division. And basically the second armored division is moving and the ghost army is trying to make it seem like they're not moving. So that to the Germans, it looks like they're staying in the same place when they're actually moving into the front line, actually at the pivot point between American um, uh, and uh, British forces near the Foray de Cerasi. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and that deception is uh, okay. It probably doesn't have any impact. They are still trying to figure out what in Lord they're doing because. Oh, 
World War II situation was very trustworthy of their allies. They always wanted to reinvent everything themselves. Um, but they go on to do some really amazing deceptions. Sadly, they're out of the scope of Normandy, but I'll mention them just briefly yeah, please, because- Please tell us, yeah. Uh, they, they do a wonderful deception, mostly with radio. And they devised, a, in addition to the three types of deception I mentioned, radio and sound and visual, they devised a fourth type of deception that they called special effects, which the idea being that if we're pretending to be the 75th Infantry Division, we better mark our vehicles with the 75th Infantry markings and put 75th Infantry patches on and be going into cafes and you know having MPs at intersections and stuff in case the Germans have left any spies behind. So they called that, they actually impersonated commanders. We didn't, they didn't impersonate Montgomery, sadly, but uh, uh, up to the American divisional level, they did impersonate the commanders of those divisions. Um, and so they did a, a, a deception that tried to convince the Germans that they were, that uh, Patton's forces were going to be clearing out Brittany when in fact most of them were going in the exact opposite direction. And that may have contributed at least in small part to the, uh, uh, the destruction of the German 7th Army at the Falaise Gap. Falaise Gap. And then um, they did uh, another deception to help Patton uh, when his uh, forces are attacking the fortress city of Metz in September, and he leaves a big gap in his line to the north, and they're able to kind of hold that gap for eight days and prevent the Germans from realizing there's a way they could get behind Patton. They're also involved in the Battle of the Bulge, and they're actually also involved in the crossing of the 21st Army Group of the Rhine River, because the 21st Army Group has the 9th U.S. Army attached to it, uh, and they do a deception to make it seem like their Rhine crossing is going to happen in a different place. So they're very active throughout the war. It's not nearly as well known as Fortitude, I think in part because it was kept secret longer, and because Fortitude is, is you know, truly more of an epic operation. This is, uh, in, I think, the Ghost Army story is an intriguing story, but it's definitely a smaller story. And Operation Fortitude. And the last thing I'll say about it is that unlike the Fortitude Deception, we do actually know the bottom of the story because we know the guys who did it. And I've been able to interview probably, I interviewed on camera 25 or so of the soldiers who served in this unit, uh, talked to maybe another 20 or 25, you know, not on camera, but making notes. So, you know, we've actually been able to get not only get the kind of the official level reports and what the deceptions were about but in the book and in the film that i made able to have the stories of the soldiers who made it happen and i think also from your book rick and i'm kind of selling your book and i'll sell try and sell josh's in a minute is that you get to know a bit about the men after the war as well because as we know with bill's father he went back and shut the hell up which is you know obviously a very co common theme but so many of the men involved in the ghost army took the skills they learned into set design and and advertising and creativity and so you have the uh you have a nice concluding story to it as well which i think is is is, is lovely to read whereas with operation fortitude and we had the same thing to, you know years ago before the enigma information came out how many of those people who've been working tirelessly to do that just came back and could never sit in the pub and tell their friends yeah. what they did yeah Whereas well, if you're an Arnhem can... veteran, you can sit in the pub and you everyone will buy it, you a drink and say, of course, son, veteran. I was in the Battle of Arnhem. I yeah. was on that bridge yeah. there. Everyone goes, yeah. well, well done, Dad. You know, But if you're involved like, in something you... where you're doing radio traffic, you haven't got that can reward. Some, Not that they're doing it for a reward. That after the war, because I know a little bit more about what he did do after the war. He didn't go into set design, but he took that um, those skills with radio and... Um, he worked in, um, he was in Indonesia in 48 doing something ridiculously um, sneaky and also in Oman and places like that. But he also was involved in um, the survey of Antarctica from aircraft with um, radio direction finders. And from that ended up working on the back, on the, the first bits of Apollo. And um, wow. he used to, he carried out experiments with, cesium beam clocks and SR-71 blackbirds trying to measure relativity in order to ensure that their radio comm from Australia up to the moon shots would work because they had to figure out what the time dilation would be over those kind of speeds and distances. 
So he did do quite a lot of interesting stuff from on from that, which, again, he wasn't really allowed to talk an awful lot about. But um, he certainly led a fairly intriguing life on the basis of what happened to him in the war. Well, that leads me into kind of my, we'll, we'll tie things up fairly soon, my kind of last question. And we know with conventional warfare, we can see direct improvements and technological advances because of World War II. You know, tanks got mm. better, aircraft got better, we had jet engines arrive, all those sorts of things. Mm. With, with deception and trickery and this, where did it go? Where did it take us in terms of, um, of our military? Have we taken this idea of deceiving the enemy to a different level? Rick, what would you say? Well, um, it's a mixed story. I think that um, when the war is over, nobody wants to be in deception because there's no promotions in deception in the United States Army. You know, you're only going to get up to a certain level. Uh, and uh, I think deception really only becomes valuable once you're uh, in a conflict where you can really use it. So I think there was a long time when the U.S. Army really kind of forgot about what they did in World War II with deception. Uh, the officers involved tried to give lectures and explain it and get generals interested in it, and they didn't, they really failed. Uh, and it really wasn't until the 1990s that the U.S. Army kind of rediscovered this story. Uh, they now kind of teach it to the people who are doing psychological operations and intelligence. And I think there is a renewed effort in deception. And of course, modern deception, people always say to me, they say, well, what's the Army do? with deception now and I say you know they they won't tell me I don't I don't know exactly <laughs> yeah um but they do they, but they, they have you, to I have kind of given they've given the secrets away haven't they exactly yeah, yeah. so but I have learned some things and I mean basically the deception uh, carried out now a lot of it would involve again the same principles but different means so for example if we say what channel is the enemy receiving information on it might be Facebook or uh, yeah. Pinterest or social, Twitter, social media, you can be sure when you look at all of the stuff that's going on with uh, the Russian bots and fake news uh, being uh, uh, influencing on British elections, on American elections, that's exactly the kind of capability, deception capability mm. yeah. that um, the U.S. Army may be looking at as well. So deception's alive and well, um, but so, I don't know exactly what they're doing. So but what we're doing now what we're doing now in talking to each other over this platform and all those other platforms that you mentioned is based on an awful lot of work that was done towards the end of the war by a lot of people on frequency hopping and all those things, mm. which are the underpinnings to Wi-Fi and this sort of com of any sort. So, true. You know, yeah. the, and, the, and the encryption that sits behind things like WhatsApp and so on is based on that kind of work. And I think maybe we don't see necessarily particularly those military applications although you know there are plenty of cold war stories which mm. are presumably not yet to be told that are about that but i think it's it's really fascinating that those sorts of experiments for a very specific brutal end have this you know very anodyne um and and free result mm. that you know we couldn't do this if those guys hadn't done that, you know, is, is it Hetty Lamar who invented mm -hmm. or at yeah, least you know, right. largely yeah. invented um, was uh, frequency hopping comms? And the, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, I think there's, so there's plenty let's, of, I'm um, gonna, one um, last question each, and it's just bring it back to World War II and 19. Yes, what's right. your absolute favorite little story? that involves deception? One little thing, perhaps the unknown story that you discovered in your research, one little. What's the best trick that we play? The little unknown trick. Well, my favourite, and I can't, wish I could remember the name of the blog. I didn't have time to check it up um, today because I was under the cosh at the actual work. But it's that Welsh nationalist who was selling batteries in Hamburg who went into Abwehr headquarters and got himself a job with the Abwehr um, and persuaded them that, you know, he'd be a really good... But this is like 1936, 1935. Mm. Um, mm. It was, his job at the time was making batteries for electronic electric boats. So very key, the Jerry's were really keen on him, the submarines, and they're like, oh, this, he sounds great, Welsh nationalist, hates the British, this is perfect, we're a perfect fit. Came back to London and went straight to MI6 and said, I've got a proposition for you. 
and he made a stack of money and he was the most awful human being as far as one can gather but it's just that brashness and also the you know in some ways with that kind of thing the Germans lost the war even before it started because they believed everything that he said from there on I mean is that is that a reasonable appreciation of that story Josh I mean you're much more on top of it than I am but I, I, you know, I I'm so that. sorry. I, I think you may be talking about Arthur Owens. Um, could be, yes. Owens. Uh, like I heard that, Russian. but I couldn't hear. I'm so, so sorry. Yeah, um, that's quite all right. But I, I Josh, love that what, particular story. Yeah. Josh, what's your favourite story? Oh, God, I just love them all. I mean, I, mm. I, I love Garbo. Oh, he's a lovely um, man. I, I think he's such... I, I love the fact that the double agents are chances. And yeah. Garbo's... It's, extraordinary chancer um, yeah. and the fact that he was pretending to be uh, 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 you know in, in England um, when mm. he, he, all he had was a, a book on the fleet and a, yeah. you know he, I mean it, it, it's just quite remarkable and also but the messages that he was sending back which was so talk. ridiculous yeah and how hard he tried to become a double agent and the British kept turning oh, yeah. him back but he just and went just ahead and did it anyway. Time it and, time. and the, the, the drive, the ambition, yeah. and the fact that nothing was going to get him down. Eventually, he was about to go to, to, to live in Brazil. You know, he, he was looking for an exit visa to Brazil. But, but you know, he got, he got his reward in the end. So he, got, he ended up with an MBE uh, uh, and an Iron Cross, which not many people can say. <laughs> not many. So, Rick, what's your favourite story? Just one well, nice little... Yeah, the fav my favorite thing is that the uh, Ghost Army did is part of their special effects is that, as I mentioned earlier, they they portrayed generals uh, sometimes in deceptions, which, of course, is completely contrary to regulations. Uh, but you'd have a, a, a major wearing uh, general stars, two stars, uh, driving around in a Jeep with bodyguards and everything, doing inspections on, uh, on supposed, supposed headquarters. Just just in case any spies are watching and the people who developed this, one of the guys in arguing for this, he used a great line. He said, you can't portray a woman if bosoms are forbidden, meaning it doesn't matter if army regulations say you can't do it. We have to be able to do this to succeed. And the one story is when they uh, they had this guy playing the general. They drive up to uh, uh, it's, it's in France near the Moselle River. They drive up to this uh, tavern um, run by a, a French proprietor who is supposedly a, a collaborator. Uh, he's by uh, the Ghost Army guys portraying the commander of the 6th Armored Division. They go in and take a case of uh, cognac or a case of some kind of liquor, uh, stealing it from the uh, tavern keeper, hopefully totally pissing him off so that uh, he'll be really uh, uh, incentivized to go and tell the Germans that the uh, 6th Armored Division is in the area. And the people who carried out that deception said that the only thing that they were worried about as they were running around impersonating a general is that they would run into a real American general and have to explain mm. themselves. And uh, that's my favorite story. Well, I think anything that ends right. up with liquor and boobs, which we seem to have done, yeah. is that's the final brilliant, You're you know, welcome. well done, Rick, <laughs> fair play. You know, boobs and boobs and boobs. I should have a drink here. I should be <laughs> yeah, I'm going I'm, I'm to start in a minute. So it's been yeah. fun, gentlemen. I've enjoyed it. I think we've learned a bit about fortitude. We've we've busted a few myths. It's not all about inflatable tanks. It's about the spy. It's about radio. It's about communications. And I've enjoyed it. And I'd love to have both of you, all of you, three of you on again in other in other chats in the future about other subjects oh, yes. related to this. It's been fun. And we've persist, uh, persevered regardless of the communication issues. Drops been, Josh has been in and out visually bill never been in but rick's been there our chicago man's been then i've been there my green screen is playing up now but for those of you watching this i hope hope you've learned something and again please I go out that was just yourself. animation of the artillery fire yeah it's an, go and yeah. buy a copy of josh's book on fortitude and and his other books of course and buy a copy of ghost army and there's a film about ghost army as well and and for those who are been just interested in the battles generally, remember that World War II was won not just by the men running up the beach with rifles. It was won by the boffins and the geniuses, twiddling radio sets, working with spies, making the inflatable tanks that all were part of the war effort. And we are able to have these conversations now because of what these people did. Yeah. So thank you on behalf of World War II TV for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll end it there. And again, Josh Levine, Rick Bayer and Bill Moffat, thank you for joining us. 
This is us signing out. We're going to go and um, join our own. Fa- uh, this is our fake personas going out. The real, the real us are already in a pub sloshed. So there we are. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll end now. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Yeah. Yeah.